breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is a failing love that you would take my place like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is a failing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my
When I cried alone, you heard my prayer. And when I smiled with joy, you laughed in my past, in my now. On the road ahead, you are there. Say 
clap there so what up? <laughs> and Yay. when the boss claps it's okay <laughs> we've got a new song for you this morning it's called God so loved it kind of moves along so if you're home you may want to stand up loving us. Thank you for the gift of your son. You, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, came up with a plan of salvation for us. What a wonder. What sacrificial love. And we celebrate with all the moms and their sacrificial love for us. And may we 
live likewise unto each other. In Jesus' name. And we all say, Amen. 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 Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing to, in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. Now, let me be the first to admit that when I came across this text this week, and I had actually looked at it and outlined it the weeks in advance as well, I was befuddled, betwixt, bewildered, and had no idea what approach to take. And that was true uh, up until yesterday at about 4 p.m. <laughs> I took a break from it yesterday and sat down and did a couple of other things and then looked at it again and I said, Lord, this is a mess. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to take it. I don't know how to approach it. Uh, it's too way beyond me. So I'm just going to kind of fumble my way through and do what I, what I think the Lord told me to do and if that works, great. And if it doesn't, well, there's next week. <laughs> and um, you can also go back to YouTube and watch uh, past broadcasts. And, you know, we pick one you like and one that worked. And <laughs> We'll see. Oh, yeah, let's change the image here. Um, I, I do need to make a couple of observations that are not on your airline. And uh, those observations are this, that um, the themes that stick out in this text are... Um, our darkness, of course, and light. So you have uh, in verse 8, uh, the darkness is passing. Uh, verse 9, it's still dark. Verse 11, uh, there is darkness and people are walking around in the darkness. So darkness, 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 and then darkness because the darkness has blinded them. So there is some darkness going on here. And I'm not going to get into, I think, what that means because we all can see in our world today that there is darkness of a spiritual nature, of a physical nature, of a mental nature, um, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's the uh, contrasting point in this text, which is about light. So you'll notice in verse 8, uh, there is the true light. Uh, it is already shining, the light is. That's in verse 8 and verse 9. Uh, if you claim to be in the light, then something needs to take place. Verse 10, uh, we're living in the light. So there's light, 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 and light. So there's this contrast between darkness and contrast between light. And then um, there's this really strange thing that you may have picked, on, picked up on. Uh, hopefully you don't pick on it, but you pick up on it, and that is... Uh, John says, Dear friend, I'm not writing to you a new commandment, but one you've already known, you've already heard about, has been from the beginning, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, well, in verse 8, well, I am writing to you a new commandment, uh, and it's the truth that's seen in Jesus. And, um, and, and I'm going, okay, well, is it a new commandment or is it an old commandment? And is he just confused and what's going on here? And I don't think John's confused. Um, uh, but um, it's, it's interesting that he says, I'm not writing you a new commandment, but I am writing a new commandment. But I, I think I have an answer to that. I'm going to share it with you here here momentarily. Um, so let's move on here. The first point is darkness, and we'll talk about light, and then we'll talk about love. And it's interesting that, that uh, I, I think the main, the main, well, the main conclusion, the main point that John is arguing for is that there is darkness and there is light, and proof that there is darkness uh, and or is light is based on how you are acting, how you are living. And I like the fact that Scripture is more than just theoretical concepts but it actually has application to our lives, to our very own people, and that we can actually see it at work, or we can see it not at work. You know, on a sunny like Mother's Day, um, as a pastor, you walk into a Mother's Day almost with fear and trembling, like you do on Christmas, like you do on Easter, like you do on Father's Day, uh, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, for fear that you won't do something right, that you'll mention the wrong thing, that you'll mention the right thing, but you won't mention it enough. You know, I'm thinking today, do I talk about Mother's Day or do I talk about um, the gentleman whose name escapes me, Amud Ar Arbery, something like that, 
who was killed, uh, I guess, a couple of months ago, but has really hit, hit the media lately. Uh, I've been in churches where you haven't said the right things at the right time, or you've said the wrong things at the wrong time, and then I, you hear about it. <laughs> And I'm here to tell you, um, I'm so pleased and so thrilled uh, to be a part of this church because I don't hear those things here, uh, which is a blessing and a half. Uh, you have no idea what a blessing and a half that is because uh, I, I'm not afraid here to say things that I think God has told me to say and then not say things and to not get it right. Um, I once didn't preach on a Christmas theme at Christmas and I heard about that. I once didn't, once didn't say enough about veterans on Veterans Day, and I heard about that. So um, here in the context of John wrapping this whole thing up with love, can I just say that I am very appreciative that this congregation uh, embodies that uh, beautifully, magnificently, uh, which uh, has value to a pastor of in, in, that is immeasurable. And thank you very much. <laughs> So don't change that today, okay? <laughs> I know you won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that being said, uh, it starts here by saying this. Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. Now let me just say this, and I've got to refer to my notes here because I wanted to make sure that I got this. I, I felt like I needed to share this two weeks ago, and I didn't. Uh, none of you complained about it, so that's good. Um, but I'm going to share, share it with you today, and that is this. And this is, this is rather obvious, but it's so obvious you have to declare it, and that is that there is light and darkness. I say that because in today's religious context, we don't talk much about darkness anymore. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we talk about love, uh, God's love, we apparently don't even mention that there are some right things and there are some wrong things. So there is dark, there is light, there is good, there is bad, there is right, there is wrong, there is God, there is Satan. All right? Um, to do whatever you want to do uh, and think that it's okay is wrong. Because there is a God, there is a standard, he set that standard, we're to live by that standard, and if you don't live by that standard... Uh, then you're, you're just flat out walking in darkness. And I, I think I'll be able to prove that here as we, as we move along. So um, I got that out. I feel better. Um, <laughs> we, we can move on, right? <laughs> uh, see, this isn't about you. It's about me. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully it's about you. Uh, so uh, do I need to explain that there's a little bit of hate in this world and that we hate our brother just to, to, to a little degree or our sister? or our cousin, or our nephew, or our mom, or our dad. One of the shows I like to watch, and it's probably not a good show to watch, uh, which is way past into reruns, is Forensic Files. I love to watch it because I like to find out how they find out, you know, a fingerprint here, a tooth, a tooth there, uh, whatever, and that they go out and, and find somebody. Um, it's also quite morbid and can be quite depressing, but uh, uh, I'm fascinated that they're able to go down and find things out that you would never think you would ever be able to find, and they do. Kind of reminds me about our lives. You know, God, we're speaking about light today, and one of the things we're going to mention is that light scatters things that are dark, and uh, that's a good thing so that we can get rid of them. But anyway, I just want to make some observations for you here, and that is that death is real. Um, death is real, uh, except for a couple of people in the uh, Old Testament. Uh, Speaking of it called out, I once shared that, every, that, that the death rate was one for one, you know, uh, except after church, uh, one little nine-year-old came up to me and said, Pastor, you're wrong. <laughs> what about Enoch, who walked with God? And I'm going, oh, yeah. What about Melchizedek, who apparently had no beginning and no end? And then who was the other guy? Uh, was it Elijah or was it Elisha? Who, Elijah, who was just wished up, wick, wick, uh, whatever, up into heaven? And going, well, doggone it all, nine-year-old, you got me. <laughs> so, you know, if a nine-year-old picks up on you, holy cow. But uh, he was right, and I was wrong, and I admitted it, and I felt foolish, and I also felt uh, other things I won't go into. Uh, death is real. It's going to happen to all of us. Enough said about that. Um, but the good thing is, according to this text, I'm not, not giving you the references here, you know, you're a student of the Bible, figure it out yourself. Um, it's passing away. Death is passing away. Now, 
I don't mean that death means you're going to pass away, although it is true. You're going to die and you're going to pass away, but fortunately, according to the Bible, it is, it is passing away. It is, it is fading. Now, if you happen to have coronavirus or some other indication of that nature and you're in a hospital, you're thinking this death is not passing away at all. Well, according to Jesus, because of his resurrection from the dead, it, it, is, it is fading away. It is going away. There is a day when it will be gone. But we're still living in the darkness. And it's defined, among other ways, by hate, by self-interest, by self-absorption, uh, by focusing on yourself. Uh, and, uh, and without Christ, you're in the darkness. Now, the interesting thing is you can be in the darkness and not know that you're in the darkness. Because you don't, you don't know any better, and unfortunately, most of the world is in the dark because they don't know Christ, they have not responded to Christ, they have not accepted Christ, they have, they have uh, no idea of what they're missing, and, and that's really unfortunate. Um, we are living in a, in a dark world that rejects Christ. We have the light of Christ in our own lives, and when you have the light of Christ, and when you see what the light can do, and when you see what the light exposes, and you see that the light of Christ exposes the darkness in you, um, what was it, Jesus, who said, how great is that darkness? How great is that darkness? Um, and uh, people in the dark, dark don't know where they're going. They don't know where they're going. And there's a whole lot of people in this world who don't know where they're going. And I mean that, I guess I mean that figuratively and literally. When you, receive, when you don't receive Christ and you reject Christ, you will go where you want to go, which is a place without Christ. And uh, that's where you're going. And you don't know it. Uh, but also, if you don't know Christ, you are living in the darkness. And you, if, you don't have the, if, you have, if you don't have Christ and you're in the darkness, you're going to step a whole lot more than your toe. And that's not going to be a happy place. And... Um, they are blind and their foolish hearts are darkened. Isn't it interesting that when you, reject the, when you reject the Christ, when you reject Jesus, the Bible says in Romans 1, as an example, that you're going to continue to um, get darker and darker. You've rejected the one who gives you the light. And uh, the Bible refers to that as your foolish heart is darkened. So, how are you feeling right about now about this darkness? <laughs> you want a solution to the darkness? Of course you can. Now, do you see this? I have an icon here for Star Wars the episode, epilogue, episode 9, and uh, then I have uh, the, the Rise of Skywalker, and then I have a logo for Hallmark, Hallmark Movies and Mysteries. Does anybody have any idea what those two movie genres have in common? I heard something from the peanut gallery in the back. Light and dark, yes. Now, I'm not afraid to say, I'm, I'm, let me put it this way, I'm man enough <laughs> to say that, I, that I, uh, I've been watching way too many Hallmark movies lately. <laughs> and you want to know who was the one who at about 7 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night says, no, no, no. Hold on, hold on to your hats and glasses, folks. You're in for the wildest ride. Um, who's the one who asks to watch a Hallmark movie? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> it's because I love my wife, for one thing, and I value, the, uh, the, uh, I value what she brings to my life. And there's nothing like going to bed after seeing a really lovely, violent, free, purely love-oriented uh, movie. In fact, last night uh, we watched uh, Mag Magnum had two episodes on apparently on Friday night. And uh, we watched one and got that done at about 7.30 or 7 o'clock. We took a break, did some other things, including me coming back to work on this thing because I was, I was uh, in need of working on it. Don't say... Uh, Never mind. Um, I know what you're thinking, and don't say it. <laughs> but you know, what, you, you know what each of them have in common is light and darkness. You're absolutely right. Yep, light and darkness. But last night, while we were watching uh, the Hallmark movie, and I'm t spending way too much time on this, but you're enjoying it, right? All right. Yeah, okay, please. good. <laughs> At a certain spot on the movie, which is about 20 minutes before the movie's over, Hallmark. Are you with me? I'm going, where's the conflict? 
because it gets to a spot where everything's going smoothly and they're starting to fall in love and then some major catastrophe happens and pulls them apart and you're going, no, the, the, the world was good. Uh, love and, and sensibility were going to reason out. And last night I said, I don't, I don't see where it's coming, but I know it's coming because it's a Hallmark movie, right? In fact, whenever they kiss, they say, I, I always say, uh, after, after watching this, I say, roll the credits. Because as soon as the kiss happens, roll the credits. I mean, it's predictable. Is there any reason why we know from a fact that any good movie, any good drama, book, whatever it is, comic strip, has light and dark and has conflict? It's because I believe it's built, into the, it's built into the universe. God's built it into the universe. He's built it into us. We are trying to figure out the answer in all of our movies, comic books, et cetera, et cetera. Let me put it this way. What the U catastrophe is, and I mean the EU, uh, that's, that's actually a word, U catastrophe. Eucharist means good grace. Eulogy means good word. You catastrophe means the good catastrophe. You know what the good catastrophe is? That Jesus Christ went to the cross and he died. To solve the catastrophe of our world. So here's one thing that's free, no extra charts, all right? <laughs> when you watch a Hallmark movie, walk, look for the catastrophe and then look for the you catastrophe. When you study culture, when you study history, look for the catastrophe and then look for the you catastrophe, the good catastrophe, where God enters in and God delivers and God divines what it is that he wants to do. Do you happen to know uh, that this last week, uh, uh, and I wasn't going to share this, and I don't have the documentation in front of me, but uh, what was his name? Uh, Little Richard, good golly, Miss Molly. Uh, after early on in his career playing around with whatever sexuality, sex, sexuality gender he was, and apparently he was quite confused with that, he came to Christ. And, he's, he, and he gave his life over to Christ. And then the catastrophe, if I can carry this out just a little bit farther, bear with me, of his sexuality met a you, a good catastrophe in Jesus Christ. And he was brought back to the light. He was taken out of darkness. And he's with the Lord in heaven today. Isn't that exciting? And isn't it exciting that God has done that with me and God, God has done that with you? If you're in Jesus Christ. Um, even though, as the song goes, you may still be dabbling with failures and, 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 uh, and uh, addictions. All right, enough of that. Uh, don't send me any cards or letters. I've seen, the, I've seen the value of Hallmark. But I can watch Bruce Willis in all those uh, too late to die, too soon to die, die today, die tomorrow, die harder, all those things. So... Um, don't doubt my masculinity. Uh, but, you know, masculinity can sit in there with the wife and enjoy a really good heart, uh, heart, heart uh, rending. And I, I, and I will leave it there because I'm going down a dark place. Okay. Back to light. Dark, darkness brings death. Light brings life. Jesus is the light of light. So... Uh, we need to see here in this text that there is the true light. So in verse 8, uh, I'm writing to you a new commandment. It's truth. And the darkness is passing, and the true light is already shining. The true light is already shining. Let's just make sure that we all know that the true light is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Uh, we're going to get into that here, here shortly, and, and I think something that's going to really be quite... Uh, quite uh, so here's my random thoughts on this. And they're not random thoughts, they're from Scripture, but uh, the light has come. Okay, so there was darkness. The darkness is here. The light has come. Isn't it interesting that in Genesis chapter 1, the very first verses says that the Spirit of God was brooding over the darkness, uh, over the darkness, whatever that was. And, and then out of the darkness, out of the chaos, uh, God brought light. God exposed the darkness and created good things. And I'm so glad that in Jesus Christ, God's able to take the bad of our lives, the dark of our lives, and make, 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 it, uh, make it light, make it good, make it useful, give life. Uh, John says here, you've, you've had it and you've heard it. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, in uh, verse 7, he says, uh, well, it's, an old, it's, it's, uh, it's not a new command, it's an old, it's an old command. And uh, part of the reason it's an old command is because it's a command that God gave us from the very beginning. In fact, the original, the original story was to love. Uh, God's original plan was to love. And then he had to pour out his wrath because we decided we didn't like his love, we wanted to do our own thing. And actually, it was in God's love that he poured out wrath. As a matter of fact, if God had, had not loved us to the nth degree, he would have let us do whatever it is that we wanted to do. When my children, uh, when they were younger, did things that uh, were not good, I would not have been a very loving dad if I had not corrected them, if I had not reached down to them and, and done whatever course of action needed to happen so that they would not continue to do those sorts of things. <laughs> um, and if God did not love us, he would not discipline us. If God did not love us, he would not uh, say that there are consequences for our action. So when, when uh, and this is one of my pet peeves about the world today, when people say that you need to love one another, well, love also means that they're right and wrong. Love also means that there's consequences for things. And to just let everybody do whatever they want to do is not love. Um, that's not love. Uh, God so loved the world that he brought his only son to die for us. Why did God just say, well, nobody needs to die. Just go, ahead, go, go along and be happy. And God says, no, there's consequences for sin. There's consequences for wrong. Darkness has a price, and we're going to have to pay that price if we're going to move on and have the light uh, give life. Um, you've had it from the beginning. That was the original plan, to love one another, to love God. Uh, God has always meant love to be at the core of his plan. And it's interesting that the very first two children of the very first two humans committed the very first sin when one of them killed the other. And then if you study that throughout, throughout the Bible, you notice it just got, it went from better to worse, to worse, to worse, to worse. And then God said, I'm sick of this whole thing. Let's get rid of the whole thing, except for Noah and his family, because they're righteous. And then after that, as soon as Noah came out with his family, they all committed sin. Can you imagine God's heartache when, oh, gee, you're at it again. We just started, started from scratch. <laughs> any, of you ever, any of you ever had any kids who, once you corrected them for something and they repented and so forth and so on, they went right away, right, right back and did something uh, there again? Uh, but there is the true light. It's Jesus Christ, and the light is already shining. Thank God that the light of Christ is shining in this world because there is no light of Christ, there'd be no hope, and this would be a pretty dismal, dark place. Um, I want to share with you some words that uh, Lambert Dolphin uh, shared in an article I found online uh, this week called Physics and the Bible. Now, a very brief history to him uh, is that he studied physics and electrical engineering at Stanford University, and then he went to work for SRI, which I think stands for Stanford Research Institute. However, um, Stanford Research Institute became, sometime in the 1970s, SRI, and became disassociated with Stanford and became its own agency. Anyway, their job is, to research, and, is research and innovation, uh, working on some of the world's most important problems, collaborating across technical disciplines, and spark new ideas and solutions. So <clears throat> whenever I find a, and he's a Christian, so whenever I find a Christian who's a physicist, uh, electrical engineer and all that good sort of stuff, who believes in Jesus, who believes in physics and then links it to the Bible, I, I stand up and take notice because most people think Christians have lost their heads and actually Christians are more intelligent and more uh, wise than the rest of the world uh, because they have the light of Christ, right? Anyway, you probably can't read this, but I put the most important quotes in your outline and these first ones are just kind of the setup for that. But uh, he says this, many different kinds of electronic sensing instruments now tell us vastly more about the cosmos then our eyes alone can tell us directly. Gravitational forces seem to, be us, seem to us to be powerful because it is gravity which holds us to the Earth's surface and makes us work hard to life and move things. So he's talking about how there's all sorts of different instruments, electronic sensing, sensing sort of things, and then he talks about gravity. And gravity is rather fascinating, he says. But, but then he says this, but the force of gravity is actually some 42 orders of magnitude weaker and the electrical forces of which generate light waves and radio waves. So one of the things he says in this article is, we all think gravitational is pretty, gravitation is pretty strong, right? And um, they don't know this yet, but uh, they suspect that there's something called a graviton that is actually a, a, a pulse of some sort, an energy force of some sort, 
that actually is going back and forth and holding the whole thing together. They, they really can't explain gravity yet, and they, and, but, they, but they suspect, they posit that there's something called a graviton. And it's got to be really pretty powerful, right, to keep the Earth and the Moon hanging together in, the, in that sense, and then, then they keep the Sun, Venus, and all these other things hanging together and doing all this thing, you know. So, I mean, gravity's got to be pretty strong. But what he says is what they've studied, and I don't, I don't know how they figure out. I'm not, a, I'm not a physicist, but what he said is the force of gravity is actually 42 uh, to the what? Right, orders of magnitude, that whole thing, um, weaker than light waves and radio waves. Now, that kind of blows my mind, but uh, it's kind of fascinating, and it, it gets me to thinking, okay? Does it get you, anyone here to think? Yeah, all right. Um, then he says this, suffice it to say that energy and information can be transmitted across the universe by means other than ordinary photons. Uh, and, he, and then he talks about how we have FM radio and AM radio, and we have uh, infrared, and we have uh, microwave waves, and we only are able to see a, a minute uh, spectrum on, on the photon, on the light scale, <coughs> but that there's all this other, other scale going on. Gravitons be one of them. Uh, that is, energy and information transmission in the physical world is probably not always electromagnetic in nature. All right? Have I lost anybody yet? And then he says this, and this is just kind of an interesting thing that I never thought about before. And he says, and this is not taking into account how prayer and spiritual forces travel between God, man, and the angels, about which we know next to nothing. So here's a guy who's a physicist who's thinking about all this sorts of stuff. He probably ought to not be. Um, <laughs> No, it's good that he does. I'm glad somebody can do this. I'm glad somebody who's a Christian and, and, and a, a physicist can put that all together. And he says, and then he says, oh, by the way, yeah, there's all these sorts of waves to which information can be traveled back and forth. And then he actually posits, and we, he actually posits in the article, he says, you know, here's the reason why we might be able to travel faster than the, the speed of sound, the sp speed of light. And... Uh, uh, he wraps it up with gravitons. And I'll post this online so you can read it as well. But then he thinks, well, how, does, how do our prayers get communicated to God? Faster than the speed of sound, faster than the speed of light. Well, what medium does that take place? And that's all I want to say about that. But isn't that, I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating. Now, he says here, the whole point about God's being light is that the splendor and radiance of his immediate presence is so intense, it must be veiled in clouds of thick nargus. Otherwise, mere mortals would be burned up to a crisp if they came into the unveiled presence of his effulgent power. I'll let you look up effulgent. That's a cool word, isn't it? God, <laughs> were his light unveiled, would fill the, and flood the entire universe with his presence to such a degree that there could be no ordinary nighttime anywhere. Okay, let, let me stop there for just a second. If, there, if God were to, to re re remove whatever is covering his glory right now, and when he came to earth he had to cover it with clouds, because when, when God came down and, and, uh, and recognized Jesus as the Son of God and whom he was well pleased, <coughs> there were clouds. When the disciples, James, John, and Peter, were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, and uh, God came down and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him, there were clouds. When Moses went up to the mountain and was doing all those things with uh, God and so forth, uh, God brought clouds. And when Moses said, by the way, God, show me your stuff, show me your glory, God said, you can't because you'd be killed. And so I'll just kind of uh, put you behind a rock, and then I'll take my hand out, and I'll cover you over, and you can see what has, what has, what has passed. You can't even look at me in, in real time, okay? You've got to look at what's, what's the result of me passing you, which is pretty wild. So <clears throat> if God were to remove that, there's nowhere, anywhere in the entire universe that we know of now where there would be any shadows. <coughs> so I'm sitting outside last night, kind of wrapping up this whole sermon thing, and if you follow me on Facebook, you'll notice that I was out last night with, uh, in, a, in a nice little setting and just kind of thinking about God and, and so forth. Um, and Labert Dolphin wraps it up 
this way. He says, therefore, the spiritual world where he dwells, where God dwells, wherever that is, <laughs> surrounding us on all sides, a world in which the material creation is embedded, is not only more solid than our world, it is also brighter. It is full of light, in fact. Living as we do at present in a world still relatively dark, we await the coming of the dawn. So, God's kind of holding his hand back because if we were to see him and if we were, you know. I put new lights in our downstairs bathroom. Well, actually, there's four lights there on a, on a four-light fixture, and I had to pull two out to put somewhere else, and I brought new ones. I didn't know that the ones that were there were, were, were yellow-tinted. <coughs> Excuse me. And that the ones I bought uh, were white-tinted. Well, I guess they're not tinted. And the white ones just blast out the yellow ones, and it's got this weird little, you know, 70s, you know, lava, lava lamp look to it. <laughs> and, my, and my wife said, is there something different in here? How come it's so bright? It's because I, I did that. And uh, imagine the brightness of God who were to drop. And it, you'd be blinded as well as dead. Anyway, I hope that meant something to somebody. It sure did to me, and once again, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing it for me, so I'm, I'm pleased. Oh, there's one more. <laughs> Here we go. This is the last one, I promise. The Bible's use, it's interesting, he says, that the Bible's use of language for Jesus, such as the rising day star and the sun of righteousness, are, quote, symbols which suggest to us that his true splendor is greater than, any, that, than that of any star or any known source of light and power in our physical world. That's how bright God is. That's how light God is. That's how magnificent God is, marvelous, majestic God is. And we run around on this earth thinking that we have power to pull a whole, whole, off a whole lot of stuff and get caught up in the darkness, and God says, really? Are you serious? I mean, really? Is that what you're focused on? All right, here's the upshot of the whole thing is that there ought to be love that is manifested because God brings light and gets rid of the darkness. Now, here's a really strange thing that I don't quite have a handle on quite yet. In fact, I gave this whole text to my wife yesterday, which I do when I'm really, when I'm really stumped, and I said, okay, Sandy, could you, make, could you make sense of this? And she looks at it for about 10 minutes and comes and says some great stuff and writes notes and so forth and so on. Um, and I'm sorry, Sandy, I couldn't use any of that today because it was just too big, you know. Except she made sense of this, and I ought to have her here right now and have her convey that to you because I'm still a little stumped, except when you come to the light in Jesus Christ and all the darkness is removed, it's all good. <laughs> can, I, can I put it that way? It's all good. There's nothing in him to make him stumble. Um... That's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> there's, a, there, there, there's a miraculous thing that happens when Christ comes in your life. Now, now I, do have a, I, do have a, I do have an answer to that. Is there's nothing to, to cause him to stumble because Jesus removes all your sin. Okay? And then we, then we like to go back, you know, and dig it up and, and work on it some more. And God says, let's remove that. So the point being is if you're in Christ, you're in the light, you're not in the darkness, sin, you're all good. It's all taken care of. So love is seen in Jesus, love is seen in you. Now here's the amazing thing, and here's where I should have shared the point about how you guys love me to the nth degree, and, and God has br brought great healing in my life because of you, and I know most of you have experienced great healing because you're part of this church. And what a, what a miracle of God's grace. But I love the fact that this, this, this light and this love is seen in Jesus and is seen in you, which is one of the reasons why it really uh, is pathetic in one sense, that we can't get together because I need to see you to see Jesus. I mean, I, I can see Jesus, but I also see Jesus manifested in you. And when I do some stupid thing and you say, that's all good, you know, when I was leading music up here, thank God I don't have to do that, Kelly and Lily. Um, <laughs> we're going to just lock you into a lifetime contract, right? Um, and then when, you're, when your life is over, it'll be a, it'll be a, a summer with Bernie. 
Uh, we'll just prop. Weekend with Bernie. We'll just prop you up, and we'll play the old songs, and we'll get an audio animatronic thing here, and have your hands move. You know, this kind of a thing. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Uh, we're not letting you go. Um, it's seen in Jesus. It's seen in you. We live in the light. You love your brother. You are in the light. Uh, you're giving oneself away, and that's all I have to say about that. All right. Um, now. Here's the crazy thing about the Apostle John, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. I'm going on way too long. Um, I'm all right, good. Um, if I were me by now, I might have switched to another channel. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and what's amazing about this church is you don't. I mean, that's just, that's just, that's strange. You guys are odd. <laughs> slow, slow learners, I, I like that. Now, here's the amazing, here's the strange thing about John. It's not strange at all, but it's, it's the amazing thing about John, and that is this. He's always talking about love. For crying out loud, John, get off this love thing. So you go to the Gospel of John, and it's chapter 13, and chapter 14, and 15. It's all about love. And here in 1 John, it's love in chapter 1, and chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. And I was going to bring all those things to you, and we don't have time except... In John 13, it says this, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was turning to God. So, here's Jesus, the creator of all this light that dispels all the darkness, who's brighter than all of the stars, suns put together. And then, it, 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 how, does anybody know how far uh, the planet Venus is from us? Well, I'm outside last night, and I've got this little app that says that this is Venus out there, and I'm thinking, Venus is... Millions of miles away, right? You'll tell me here in just a minute. But the sun is so bright that it's beaming off of Venus, and that light is then beaming back to me, to us, bright enough to where I can see it. But it's not emanating that light. Venus isn't. It's reflecting the light. 34.11 million miles away. So the sun is bright enough to reflect off of Venus. However far, and you don't need to do this, however far the sun is from Venus, and then that sun is so bright, it's able to reflect that sun off of Venus back to me, you, us, 34.11 million miles away. Wow, what if you were on the sun and you, were, and you, and, and you had that reflected off of you, you? You'd be dead. But then God's brighter than all the suns and, all, and, all the, and everything there is anywhere ever. Okay? That's how powerful he is, okay? And this God, who's so powerful, so bright, so magnificent, so full of light, so holy, got up from his meal, took off his outer garment, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, began to wash his disciples' feet, and dried them with a towel that was wrapped around his waist. That's love, folks. How does the God of the universe pull that off? It's because he loves us. And Jesus says this, do you understand what I've done for you? Uh, frankly, no, I don't understand. <laughs> do, you under, do, you under, do you understand power like that? Do you understand power that is manifested in love like that? Do you understand a love that is so powerful that is willing to completely and wholly give itself up? for these little runts that run around Earth. And I, I'm personally convinced there's no other life on any other planet anywhere else, but it doesn't matter. But what if there was no other life anywhere else in the entire universe? What would that say? I think it would say that we are super, super important. In fact, I think we're so important that the God of the universe came to Earth and set it up only here, so that we would know that love. Now, here's the, here's, the, uh, here's the crux of the whole thing. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. And the only, really, the only way you're going to really do that is if you really come to grips with what the Lord Jesus Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, did for us. And I, and I believe that's one of the amazing things about this church is that this church grasps that. I don't know what else to say about that. I've set an example that you should do as I have done for you. 
So how powerful is God's love if he can make this? And that's a black hole somewhere over a million miles away. You know, uh, speaking of Star Wars and parsecs, remember when, Luke, uh, when uh, Han Solo says, I can do 12 parsecs in... Yeah, a castle running 12 parsecs, and I looked up parsecs, and par, a parsec is, is the equivalent of 19 trillion miles. Um, and then last night I saw uh, out, in the, out in the heavens something called the coma, the comma, what is it, uh, uh, comma star cluster. And they found out that um, it's... Uh, approximately 86 parsecs away. They had to come up with the term parsec because they couldn't, there's no, you can't have enough zeros after the thing to, you know, so it's just like this. And then they have astronomical units and, and all sorts of things. And I'm going, I'm looking at something that's 86 parsecs away or 86, 19 trillion miles away. And the love of God is so close that it's come to me Farther than that away, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, in the person of Jesus Christ. So the brilliant, incomparable, unapproachable light of the world in the person of Jesus Christ has demonstrated his love to us by removing us from darkness and removing it from in us. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I can't even begin to imagine what a parsec is, let alone what, how long it takes for even light to travel that distance. It blows me away, but uh, what blows me away more is that you are that powerful, that big, that expansive, that glorious, that beautiful, that powerful, and that you cared enough for us to uh, come and be a servant and give up every single right you had to wash our feet. Knowing that um, you deserved uh, every eye and ear and human and everything ever created to be at your feet and to worship you. Lord, as we look at today and the various things that we get caught up in, uh, Lord, would you help us to show that you've overcome the world? And that the light of Christ in our hearts is greater than anything else. And that we are overcomers in Jesus Christ. And that the light, uh, the, the, the darkness is passing away and that the light is coming. And Lord, that we need to hang on to you because um, one day the travails of this world will all be over. And what a magnificent day that will be. Lord Jesus, our, day, our, our, our shining star be praised and glorified forever. Amen.
son for redemption The price for my heart I don't have a context For that kind of love I don't understand So love the world. My dear friends, may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you today and forever.